What's going on, guys? It's Frito here for your Overwatch today. We've got a very important get good guide. We're going to cover all the fundamentals of positioning, the core fundamentals that players struggle with at low ranks, and then the more complex positioning decisions as you move up the ranks. So this video should have a little bit for everybody. As always, this series is heavily fueled by the submissions that you send in to your Overwatch plays at gmail.com. You upload a lost gameplay to YouTube where you thought you played your best, but lost anyway, or just weren't sure why you lost in general. Now, normally I try to respond to as many of these as I can, but because every time I mention this, we get hundreds and hundreds of responses, I physically can't keep up. So no longer can I promise that everyone's always going to get a response, but I do try to respond to many of them. But because we want to always feature the newest patch submissions that stay in the email for too long, I'm just going to have to move past. But for those of you that definitely want to guarantee that you can get feedback on your gameplay, whether it gets used in a video or not, we have a new option for you. We just launched memberships on the channel, which is kind of like a Twitch subscription that allows you to support YouTube content creators. As you've noticed, we've been doing more live streaming as well. You'll get a badge that shows up in our live stream chat, but as well the comment section and your Overwatch custom emojis when you tune into our live streams. But the best feature of all is the perk we're adding with it is that for members, we're going to make a priority queue to get your gameplay reviewed, allowing you to send in one gameplay per week. So I know membership's kind of pricey for a lot of people and not going to be an option for many of you, but if you want a dedicated coaching, this is actually one of the cheapest ways to get it in a bit more of a smaller scale, not to mention the other benefits that members will get incorporated with the live stream and anything else that we can think of. So if that sounds like something that's interesting to you, you can go ahead and click the join button next to the subscribe button and sign up for that and start getting feedback on your own personal gameplay so you know what things you have to work on. And and don't worry, this won't change anything about our normal content schedule. And you still, of course, can send in normally to the email. The only problem is because we get so many, it's hard to respond to them all. Now, with that out of the way, let's get on to the video. We'll start off looking at Ana gameplay because she's a character that you very readily can see common positioning mistakes. Now, this is a silver Ana player and they struggle with aim as well. But you can see the bad habits of positioning and movement in this as our hero seemingly is running after the play, kind of running in circles, repositioning constantly constantly to try to set up easier shots rather than holding a strong position where you have a good line of sight to see everything and be safe behind your team. This is smart positioning in its most basic form. Whereas if our team wants to hold the choke, if our Ana player hides behind this piece of cover, the car, we can see the entire play and slowing down, taking more time to aim rather than move while holding a strong angle will allow us to hit all of our abilities. And the thing that you don't want to happen and is a really bad mistake is frontlining as a squishy Ana player. You may see some mechanical gods pull this off once in a while when they run in to go kill the enemy as a support. This is called Jonacking. But until your mechanics are that good, it's a very bad mistake to be in front of your own front line. It makes you vulnerable, but also it deprives you of information of who on your team needs healing and takes much more time to pan your camera around and continue spinning around trying to find where you're supposed to go, where a stronger position in the back where you can see everything will work a lot better. We see this tendency of our hero get capitalized by the enemy Roadhog, who's a character who just seeks and destroys. As soon as you see this enemy Roadhog being in hook range of you, you need to get behind cover, get behind your team, fall back, be safe in a spot where you can see your team and avoid the enemy. But if we tunnel vision on just hitting our abilities and trying to constantly output something rather than being safe, this Roadhog easily can hook us. Now he misses it, and realistically, we should have died to this, but look as the mistake continues, a big percentage of the time we're playing in front of our team. And part of this is a meta concern as well. When the enemy Sigma has a shield in your face as Ana, you can't really get to your team and play the positions you want, which is partially the reason why she doesn't get played that much right now. But now that's a typical type of problem that silver level players face, but let's move it up a level. Now we're looking at our players around gold or platinum as Ana. You'll notice here that this Ana player is better at keeping their position in relationship to the team fight as it ebbs and flows. As the enemy push back, our hero keeps a better relationship between their position and our front line, always staying a bit further back in safety so you can heal the team, see the whole play, and maintain staying in that safe zone. Okay, so what's the problem here, Frito? Well, in Overwatch, because it's such a complex game and there's so many different hero matchups and map types, what makes for good positioning changes based on what your win condition is. So whereas this positioning looks strong and we're holding everybody up, 
up against this far a spam it eventually starts to look like a bad strategy if you do it all the time when you need to be positioning more aggressively this is something that I talked about at length in a full video called the number one mistake all plat players make and it's surrounding this concept of not knowing when to go aggro or being willing to take a risk once you get up to plat rank you're typically pretty good at maintaining your position and not dying but getting beyond it you have to know when to go a bit more aggressive because as we start to crumble here on point a simply healing away the forest damage will eventually be a losing strategy for Ana. Moira can do it a bit better because she has a bit more volume of heals but unless Ana plays perfectly it's pretty hard to keep your team alive while they're constantly getting shelled by Farah and we can see more clearly why keeping only only passive positioning can be a bad thing if you fail to keep the proper relationship up against Afara. Notice where Ana's playing, staying true to the rules we've already established, safe behind the team, we can't get shot at, we can shoot the entire team and the enemy, everything should be fine, right? Well, not exactly, because allowing for the engagement to get to this point lets the Farah have a far easier time than if we played more aggressively with our McCree. Because what you'll notice is happening, yeah, sure, we could have played mechanically more perfect and hit every ability flawlessly, and maybe we have a chance to win from this position, but realistically what our McCree's trying to do is go take an open angle outside in the open space where Farah has no vertical cover to play around because we're playing in the back we can't really help him either by healing him or putting our utility out aggressively towards the Farah. The thing is, support players, there's a lot of DPS matchups that support characters are way better at beating than even their DPS counterparts. Ana has a sniper, she heals herself, she can sleep far out of the sky, she has many ways to aggressively attack Farah. and if you and McCree go off to the right and take the engagement more aggressively down the street, or even ideally all the way at the bridge, Farah has no cover whatsoever, but by playing too passively, you allow the Farah to get up to her sweet spot close up against the cover where she can dive bomb and retreat and constantly get healed and you just don't have the damage combo to deal with her this is pretty important I mean I'd probably say the best option is going mercy with this McCree to pocket him on the angles he wants to go but Ana can kind of play this way too but you'll have to hit your own shots as if you're a DPS but if you decide to play this passively you might as well just give up this cart space entirely and wait till you get all the way back around when you're in the open space again with a bigger sight line up against the Farah. You never want to engage where the Farah can use cover. So we've covered basic positioning with your team, positioning for a hero matchup, now let's look at an even higher ranked level of game where now we have to worry about respawn waves and objectives our hero's name is evade which is a bit ironic because he fails to evade death a few times in these clips but his aim is incredible this is an incredibly dominant gameplay where our widowmaker hero hits tons of shots but because their aim is so good evade is confident in having poor positioning because in many cases evade's aim does bail them out of sticky situations but as you start to get higher and higher at the ranks no matter how perfect your aim is eventually the enemy will win a footsie battle against you and hit you you can't rely on winning aim duels all game long you have to outsmart them with positioning and make sure you're always taking the proper angles widowmaker is a great example for this because she's the most punishing with how you play your angles and sight lines whether you're playing as her or up against her now we'll eventually full hold here on defense of rialto b which is a pretty strong place to hold but what we start to notice the waning moments of this defense evades bad habit pops up where if you're too eager to peek at the enemy aggressively to try to get damage in constantly you're not going to be able to maintain a presence and a threat on the map and this is a bad habit that can lose games a lot of damage players you'll be surprised at the highest levels of play there's long extended points where they're doing nothing just waiting for the right opportunity to go in then they pop out with a burst of impact damage are such a high value target that anytime you poke your head out too reliably you're going to get focused no matter what hero you're on really so we've seen the bad habit nearly come back to bite evade on the defense but they end up holding anyway now as we get onto the attack we find ourselves in a position where we're winning and the only way to lose the fight is to make a positioning error nail a couple targets in the head the enemy's got no damage now all we have to do is maintain control of the map and set up for the enemy's retake we're pushing cart they can't contest it 
We can literally just hide right now and wait for the real team fight to start. This is what's called a stagger fight or a regroup. Cleaning up kills in the regroup is definitely important, but it's more important that we maintain map control and man advantage for the next actual team fight where the enemy will have an opportunity to stop the payload. Because we're so eager to constantly be shooting, we give our position away easily. And the angle we give this Widowmaker is easy as cake. I could hit this shot. And you can't make your position be known this reliably without keeping track of the Widowmaker's respawn time and playing more defensive. Because if you see what happens, once our Widowmaker hero goes down, the enemy Widow knows there is no threat. Like a shark smelling blood in the water can just relentlessly run at your team, hitting all the same headshots you did, but carrying the fight back. This is why we need to remember when it's important to maintain control of the map and just exist to occupy headspace of your opponent so they have to at least think where you are. Remember, if you pop someone and kill them, then hide around a corner for a while, the enemy doesn't know if you're going to pop out there or if you're flanking around somewhere else. You have to use those gaps and windows of time to manipulate their sight lines and expectations and make it harder for the enemy widow to constantly stare down the barrel at an easily placed, reliable peak spot that you continue to take. And all of this got a lot more complicated at this section of the video, of course, because we're dealing with a player who's currently rated at 3.3K, but was in Masters reliably for quite a while, struggling a bit in the double shield meta. And that makes sense because if we know this player's problem is positioning, you don't get rewarded as much for having great aim in this meta because there's so many shields to block your shots. You have to be able to win the positioning battle throughout the entire map because most times you're not going to be able to find those highlight reel clips where you're even able to hit multiple shots in a row. Now for the last section of the video, we're going to talk a bit about making space, which can be quite a complicated term in Overwatch and gets used in concrete and abstract ways, which makes it confusing for people. But I don't think it's that confusing when you boil it down to its basics. But in today's video, we're going to only speak on the idea of positioning in pertains to making space. And there's no better role to look at that than the tank position where where you position is about 90% of your effectiveness. And this was a game I had on my alt account and the team colors are going to swap here because it's from the old patch so don't get confused by that but the enemy orisa player spartan takes possibly the worst position i've ever seen an orisa take in a matchmaking game staying here does what i would describe as negative space which is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek remark and it goes to apply to when your tank is deciding to stay in a spot that is bad for the team to be in Granted, step one, you are holding the objective here, which is important to win the game, but by staying on the low ground, the enemy Orisa allows for the entire red team here to retake onto this natural high ground and shoot down on them like fish in a barrel. Whereas you'd have better sight lines if you played on the high ground of your side, Granted, you wouldn't be able to contest the point, but you wouldn't get shot down on. Or if you push up to intercept this enemy team that has no shield, you could actively get a halt hook combination. I would say this is a mistake I reliably see at diamond and below, where tank players aren't actively using their abilities to gain advantage in the structure of the team fight. This concept is really important in the double shields meta and really even into masters now, I'm seeing a lot of tank players that don't utilize their barriers to accomplish anything, and instead, because the Devil Shield barrier feels kind of easy for tanks right now, they think just keeping it out and managing the barrier is all you have to do, when in reality, you need to be ebbing and flowing with the team fight with the same fundamentals of positioning that we covered in the earlier sections and trying to make opportunities to get your cooldowns active and rotate the team fight into your favor. This is the concept of what making space truly is. I think if you apply this most simple principle, you'll forever understand what needs to be done in order to make space, and that is, it's to have better space than the enemy. When we're talking about positioning and the space that you occupy, your goal is to gain better ground than them and put them at a disadvantage just based on how the structure of the team fight works. This is a bit more understood in MOBA communities where you have a top-down view and it's very clear what's out of position and where things should be. It's harder to see in the first-person perspective, but really, most times when you have the strongest positioning, it in some way makes space for the team, either by helping you hold ground you already want or denying it from the enemy. Thinking back to the Ana setting up for angles to shoot the Farah, that's one version of this, but the king of making space from the support category, of course, is Lucio who he, with his movement, can manipulate the team fight to corral the enemy where you want them and directly go at DPS. And then brings up not just the positional making space concept, but the bit more of a abstract one that's hard to nail down, which is attention, resources, cooldowns, or 
just physically what you're able to see manipulating enemy sight lines. This Lucio gameplay on Ilios was a good example of me doing that. Although of course, many times I do want to stand back and support my team, but I make even more space for them by going off to duel the Widowmaker so she can't look at my team and also dancing around the enemy Doomfist, whether I kill him or not, just getting him to whiff his cooldowns on me means he's not hitting them effectively onto my teammates. This same kind of dodging to make space can be done by Mercy, for example, who at a lot of ranks, I'd say Masters and below, you very commonly hear Mercy get called out as a focus fire target. But the problem is just like up against an enemy Doom Fist or Wrecking Ball when he hits a big shield, if you call it a target that you can't kill and they run away, you end up burning all sorts of resources onto them, allowing them to make space. Because of course, Overwatch, there's so many complicated abilities in the game. It isn't simply where you're standing, but also the management of the resources of the team. If the enemy burns five cooldowns to kill very slippery characters like Wrecking Ball, Doomfist, Mercy, Lucio, and fails, well, the rest of the team has an advantage to be able to press W in that situation at a resource advantage. So it's important to remember, it isn't just where you're standing, it's the exchange of cooldowns and ultimates. And that's where things get really complicated because there's different win conditions for every matchup, depending on the map, and so many different complex ways that you can theory craft the best way to go about dealing with that situation. Well, guys, that's going to be everything for this crash course on positioning and the main things that you want to be thinking about when considering where you should be positioning the relationship to your team, the relationship to the state of the objective, all the cooldowns, making space for your team. It's really complicated, but hopefully this video was a help to you to understand what can be a pretty tricky concept in Overwatch. If you enjoyed the video, please be sure to leave it a like. It really does help us out and lets us know that you're enjoying the content. And if you haven't already, please subscribe and be sure to hit the bell icon so that you actually get notified when our videos go live. Link to the description is our Twitter where we tweet out news, updates, and dank memes. And remember, anybody can send in gameplay for review to potentially be featured in a Get Good Guide to youroverwatchplays at gmail.com. Upload a loss where you thought you played well or weren't sure why you lost. Let us know your rank in a short description of what happened. One gameplay per person, but we do get multiple hundreds of submissions, so I can't review them all or I'd never leave my PC. So if you want to get on the short list to guarantee get your gameplay reviewed each and every week, you can become a member by clicking the join button. It's priced the same as a Twitch subscription and you also get a supporter badge next to your YouTube avatar, as well as emojis to use when you come visit us on our live stream, which I hope you do. And I'd love to see you there. That's it for me. I've been Frito for your Overwatch. We'll see you guys next time.